Hi, I'm Diana. I'm 15 years old and I love crows. Have you ever needed a friend's help? To borrow money or to help with a test? Or to beat the offender? What if that friend was a crow? Watch this video to the end and find out what can repay the kindness of a smart bird. I have always wanted to have animals, but I was faced with the same problem, my dad. My dad is a unique person who combines 50% anger, 30% rage, 19% stubbornness, and just 1% sanity. That's my dad. Once, we had such a severe winter in our town that even people in fur coats were cold outside. But I had to get out because I remembered that I hadn't parked my bike in the garage. And next to it, I saw a crow. It was injured. There was something wrong with its wing and it was limping. I thought that it would not survive in this weather and I shivered. Oh, I could get into trouble for this. I grabbed the crow and, cursing under my breath, carried it into the house. Dad raged all night, but for once, I didn't listen to him. The crow would die if I threw it out, and I didn't want to kill animals. Have you ever stood up for your principles in the face of a man who could break you in half? Ugh, what a feeling. I suggested Dad to wait until spring, and in return, I would not let Quasi... As I called my foundling, out of the room, Dad didn't like the idea. He said he wouldn't wash bird droppings. But I, after all, was also very angry and stubborn, and I could insist on my own. During the winter, we became very friendly with Quasi, and I almost cried when I let her out into the woods. But I had to let her out because she was stronger and could fly safely, and Dad was getting more and more angry. How was I to know that she would not leave me? Quasi began to fly to our lawn, sometimes even with friends. Good thing it always happened during the day when Dad wasn't home. I was very afraid of his anger, and I taught Quasi to fly not to the lawn, but a little further away, to the trash next to the forest. Then, there I hung out with them, fed them, and occasionally did homework. It was great! I felt like a superhero a girl mistress of the crows, and so my two years passed. But one time a complete mess happened. I went with my crows to the trash, and Ramona noticed me. She was a stupid and evil viper from a rich family. Everybody was trying to butter her up because otherwise she would ruin your whole life. She was with her henchmen and started pointing like, oh well, look, she's a bum. What could I say? Have you ever defended your honor with fists? I lunged at Ramona, but her friends intercepted me and started pulling my hair. And then, this happened. Damn, this! A flock of crows gathered above us, and they began to attack the kids. I didn't even notice how many of them appeared. The birds attacked Ramona and her friends, but they didn't touch me. There was a scandal waiting for me at home. A good scandal. I told my mother everything, and instead of feeling sorry for me, she told my father. He arrived in the evening in a ferocious rage. During this time, the parents of Ramona and these guys called us and started complaining, saying, your girl beat up our children. Oh, and the evil and terrible Diana single-handedly beat up two guys and three girls. Who would believe that? Dad and mom believed it. Most of all, they were angry that I continued to feed my crows and, as they thought, set them on their abusers. All I'd been listening to all night was that my next prank would end up in jail. What was I supposed to do? Obediently take the insults? But Dad wouldn't listen to me. He locked me in my room, took a rifle, and went to shoot the crows. I only heard two shots, but each of them wounded my heart. What if he had killed the Quasi? Why were they doing this to me? I hated them. The attacks on me at school only increased. I was called Queen of the Trash. And one of Ramona's assholes stuffed a crow's corpse into my backpack. I started running away from school in tears. And I really didn't want to go home, but I had to. My father organized a kind of house arrest. Well, so that my mother immediately picked me up from school and did not let me out on the street later. I was angry. They drove me crazy. 
Have you ever felt that the whole world is against you? That no one, no one wants to understand you? I was crushed these days. But one day, I saw Quasi again on the lawn. We didn't see her again until the summer. Probably, my smart girl realized that there was no one else at home and decided to beckon. She looked at me and jumped a little ahead. I left the house and followed her. Quasi led me to a house in the woods, and there I saw a bunch of crows and a boy my age, maybe a little older. Quasi sat on his shoulder, and he asked what I was doing here. I told him about Quasi, and the boy was relieved and happy. He said that his name was Jamie, and that he was the owner of Quasi and the other crows. Jamie and I quickly found a common language. He fed them and trained them, just like me. And he was laughed at at school too. It was great to find someone with similar problems. We started meeting, talking. He taught me how to train crows, and in general, he turned out to be a good friend. I almost believed that something good could come into my life. Alas, a couple of months later, my parents announced that we were moving to another city. And it was my fault, they said. I ruined our family's precious reputation. I shouted back that I would rather live in a dumpster and ran into the woods in tears. I met Jamie there. The news upset him as much as it did me. And he said he had a present for me then. I swallowed my tears and thought resentfully. When would he have given this gift if I hadn't turned out that we were going to break up? But all my skepticism went out of my head when he brought me a beautiful silver ring with a raven's head on it. He said that it was his mother's ring, that it had become too small for her, and that she'd allowed him to give it to the crow's friend, as she called me behind my back. I cried even more, and promised him that I would never forget him without the ring. But I didn't refuse from it. For some reason, I felt I had to keep it. What would you do if your parents drastically changed your life without even asking for your permission? Parents are not classmates. You can't just go over and fight them. So they always take a high hand over their children. I let them move in, but I didn't let them get the crows and Jamie out of my heart. I was waiting for the call, for the letter, for anything. I spent days looking at the ring and thinking of my best friend and our crows. Nothing. Silence. A complete zero. But you know I'm not one to give up easily. A year later, I came to the city when I started my vacation. A school friend let me stay, and on the first day I told her, Okay, I'll go to Jamie. To whom? she asked. Uh, to Jamie. What's the problem? Lucia hesitated for a long time, and finally told me the terrible thing after which I fell into a chair. It turned out that Jamie died just a few months after I left. He climbed to the roof to fix it and broke his neck in the fall. His mother left town because she couldn't live in a house that reminded her of her son. I was speechless. So that's why Jamie didn't write to me. I should have known that I should have come as soon as it happened. But how could I know? I cried all evening and all night. And the next morning, I rode my bike to Jamie's abandoned house. The crows were still nestling there, and I swear to you, they were happy to see me. The house barely appeared in the horizon, and they were already rushing toward me. They surrounded me and cawed loudly, as if asking where I'd been for so long. I looked at the ring, then at the sky, and realized that if a person's soul didn't go to heaven, then it had to become a bird. And maybe Jamie, my best friend, got lost among those crows. I went back to my new home, but I didn't forget my friends. I am determined to connect my life with the birds, in memory of Jamie. Recently, my mother apologized to me for all that time. I don't know what made her do it, but I told her about going on vacation, and for the first time, I was able to cry properly. And my dad? Well, I'm sure I took after him in my stubbornness. One day he will say, I'm sorry to me, but I don't think it'll be for a long time. Did you like the story? Then hug your pets, put a like, and other viewers will see it. And don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss our new videos.
Vivian is with you, the main tamer of exotic animals in YouTube. Last time I told you how to teach a crocodile to sing, and today I'll show you how to teach your snake to dance. I stopped the live and found the video Snake Dancing to the Flute. For a year now, I've been running a channel where I upload other people's videos of exotic animal taming as my own. People like it and they believe me. Honestly, I can't stand animals. I just wanted to make some money and finally move out of this smelly apartment into a luxury mansion. But so far, things haven't been going well. After the live, I got a call on Zoom. Have advertisers finally noticed my account? I quickly combed my hair and answered. The woman on the screen introduced herself as Milana and immediately asked to tame one animal. Actually, I'm a YouTube star. I have my own show and I'm not going to do this. Then she turned the camera to the gorgeous pool. I was looking into the water and didn't understand anything. And suddenly a shark appeared right in front of the camera. Its huge jaws made me uneasy. The woman said she was willing to pay $100,000 if I made the shark tame. With this money, I can rent a luxury mansion. I spent my entire childhood in an old shack with my four sisters, and they dreamed of my own luxurious home. I immediately blurted out that I agreed, and we agreed to meet. I immediately got dressed. I caught a taxi and went to her. I promised myself that I would break out of this poverty and collect money for the coolest house. I was so caught up in the memories that I didn't even notice when I drove up to the luxurious mansion. Milana was waiting for me on the threshold of the mansion. The house looked even more luxurious from the inside. Even the separate room with the pool was in marble. But then I saw a huge shark, which was slowly winding circles on the bottom. I was stunned with horror. It could easily eat a person. Milana said that in a month, they would have very important guests. And by then, the shark should be tamed. Damn it. I didn't know what to do. After all, if they revealed that I was a fake tamer, it would be a failure. But suddenly, this Milana said that in the evening, she and her husband were leaving. And I could live in their house for a month, working with a shark. So they won't be here. I thought about it. For them, this amount was a trifle and I really needed the money. So I decided that I would send fake videos to Milana and on the day of their arrival, I would tell Milana that I needed another month. They would of course refuse and I would carefully veer off the subject. I lived like a queen all week, lying around on the deck chairs, doing nothing. And on the weekend, I downloaded a video of a pet shark and sent it to Milana. She immediately transferred an advance to my account, $2,000. When the money fell into the account, I was drinking lemonade on the veranda, and suddenly a girl came out to me. Hey, I'm going to call security. But this kiddo just laughed and said that the guards would rather listen to her. After all, she was Erica, Milana's daughter. I almost choked when I heard that. She asked sarcastically how things were going with the taming, and my heart sank. Was this a test? I got nervous and said that sharks were slow to learn tricks. But Erica suddenly shouted that I was as incompetent as all the previous tamers. She would not allow her family to pay a fraudster. Arrogant rich girl! What does she even understand? And at that moment, she went somewhere, slamming the front door. I was frantically thinking about what to do, but then Milana called me. God, did Erica sell me out? But Milana suddenly began to praise me. Her daughter said that I had already tamed the shark. I didn't understand anything. Milana happily added that she had invited all her friends over for the weekend to watch the tame shark. God, this was a complete failure. I hated this Erica with all my heart. She deliberately set me up, but I won't let this little girl ruin my plan. I tried to figure out what to do, and then I got an idea. I rushed to the kitchen. I needed to find meat and learn at least a couple of commands with the shark. But there were only vegetables in the refrigerator. And suddenly, on the last shelf, I saw a piece of ham. That's lucky. Looking around, I returned to the pool. My knees were weak with fear. But I had no choice but to throw the pieces of ham to the shark, shouting commands. But it grabbed them and didn't even look in my direction. Suddenly, on the other side of the pool, I noticed Erica. She was videoing me on her cell. What are you doing? Erica said with a chuckle that it was time for my subscribers to find out what the supposedly best tamer on YouTube really was. Not again. I ran to her and tried to grab the cell. It was already in my hands, but it slipped out and fell into the water, right into the shark's gaping mouth. We were both taken aback. You're the one to blame, Erica. Angrily, I ran out of the room. 
The next day, I woke up early and went down to the pool. While Erica sleeps, I'll try to tame the shark with the help of a hoop. But what is it? The shark was lying on its back with its eyes closed. What's happening? I quickly called the vet clinic, but none of them had any shark specialists. Heck. Finally, one doctor agreed to come, but for a thousand dollars. Oh shit. I didn't want to part the money, but if something happened to the shark, that's it for me. So I mumbled that I agreed. As soon as the doctor came, he immediately asked what I was feeding the shark. I said it was a ham, but it was not fresh. The doctor shook his head and said that the shark was obviously poisoned by something else. I turned pale. It's Erica's stupid phone. The vet gave it some drops. But when he was leaving, he said that sharks responded well to sound waves. And to make it get better faster, I could sing to her. No way! I closed the door behind him and looked at the shark. I was barely breathing. I suddenly felt sorry for it. Maybe I should try it. And I began to sing the only song I knew, a lullaby from my distant childhood. At first, nothing happened, but suddenly the shark moved its fin slightly. Was I making it? As I continued to sing, I heard someone sneeze in the corner. Erica, were you eavesdropping? I was expecting more threats, but instead, she suddenly said sadly that she was afraid it was going to die and whispered softly that we had to save the shark. I noticed that there were tears in Erica's eyes. The next morning, I went down to the pool to check on the shark, and it looked like it was getting better. Did it work? And then Erica ran to the pool. She was happy. She even had tears in her eyes. A second later, Erica fell into the water with a crash. Damn it! She slipped on the sidewalk. And then I saw the shark open its mouth and head straight for Erica. I had to do something urgently. I closed my eyes and threw myself into the water. I swam over to Erica and blocked her with my body. Up close, the shark was so creepy. I saw two rows of shark teeth. God, this is the end. I squeezed my eyes shut, but suddenly the predator began to rub its fin against my back. What? Am I alive? Am I dreaming? But the shark seemed to be pushing me, and I was holding terrified Erica in my arms. It looked like she was going to eat us. Still trembling with fear, I swam forward and dived, and the shark did the same. Was that a trick? Looked like I really tamed the shark. Wow. We spent the next hour fooling around in the water. It was so much fun. Of course, I was occasionally afraid just in case, but the shark played with us as with children. Erica was so happy and rode on the shark's back like on a dolphin. Oddly enough, Erica didn't even seem like a silly rich girl to me right now. She was just happy. Erica's parents suddenly came in. They began to rush us. The guests they wanted to show the shark to were going to arrive early. We got out of the pool and Milana handed me the money, telling me I had to go. Suddenly, Erica hugged me. She said that she finally had real friends. Me and Amu, as she called the shark. Erica added that no one was friends with her at school. Everyone just teased her for her wealth. For a second, I felt sorry for her. I had been teased before too, but because of my poverty. I was going to get my things when I heard Milana talking to someone. I closed the door and listened, and I heard her say that the shark had been tamed after all, and that the menagerie circus would buy the shark for a million dollars. I was taken aback. This was the most violent circus in the country. Animals were being bullied there. In a panic, I ran out and shouted that it was wrong, but Milana replied coldly that it was none of my business. In addition, Milana looked through all the surveillance footage, so if I tried to stop her, she would put all my videos on YouTube, and my fans would understand that I was a fake and that I did it all by accident. Confused, I wandered into the yard and suddenly saw Amu in a large aquarium in the trunk of a truck. Are they taking her away? Erica was standing there, sobbing. She put her hand to the glass, and the shark pressed its nose against the other side. No, I definitely had to fix this. But how? Looked like the only way to save Amu was to steal a pickup truck. I tried to open it, but Milana was already coming out of the house with the guests. Now Amu will be taken away. I tried to handle off the car, but to no avail. Then I was called out. It was Erica. She threw me the key. I jumped into the car in a second and hit the gas. 
and then my cell began to burst from the comments of my subscribers. Animal abuser, swindler, you're a fake. I unsubscribed. I was showered with angry comments. Milan had already posted a video where Alma was lying on its back in the middle of the pool. After my feed, tears welled up in my eyes. And just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, a patrol stopped me. The police said they had already been informed of the theft, and now I had to go with them to the police station. But all I thought about at the station was Alu. Soon it would be sold to that damn circus. It was all my fault, and no miracle would happen. But at that moment, Erica ran into the station. She blurted out to the cops that it was her family's pickup truck, and she let me take it for a ride. What? Erica, this was dangerous. The police checked her documents and then reluctantly let me go. We went out into the street, and Erica immediately ran to Amu. I lowered my eyes and said that the shark should not go to the circus, but then we would have to let it go to sea because there was nowhere else to take it. Erica looked sad, but nodded quickly. It was hard for her to let Amu go, but she understood that it was best for all of us. We drove to the sea, and I couldn't stop crying. Amu trusted us, and now we had to say goodbye. Erica said we had to hurry. Her parents might find us at any moment. Then we opened the side and released the shark. Amu quickly swam forward and seemed to take a piece of my soul with it. There was a lump in my throat. I looked at Erica, but suddenly she hugged me. And then I thought, even if I had to go back to my shabby room. Today I realized that there was something much more valuable in life than money. This was a real friendship. I hugged Erica back. We looked out to the sea and saw Amu spin. She circled the shore for a long time and then swam off into the distance. We'll miss you too, Amu. My new boyfriend Jake called me for breakfast and I went downstairs. But as soon as I entered the kitchen, I was dumbfounded. A huge black shepherd dog was standing next to Jake. It was baring its teeth and growling. I only moved in yesterday and before that, he didn't say he had a dog. My stomach clenched with fright. As a child, I was bitten by a stray dog, and I was treated for a whole month. Since that day, I've been terrified of dogs. But Jake smiled and said it was just Buddy, his favorite. I just nodded, trying not to shake. After all, if I told the truth, Jake might think I was a problem and throw me out. And going back to my parents was not an option. My mom and dad are violent alcoholics, and therefore it was simply unbearable to be at home. I had long wanted to move out of their house, but I didn't have the money to do it. So when Jake showed up at the bar yesterday and asked me to move in with him after two hours of conversation, I immediately agreed. It was my chance to escape from my parents. But this terrible dog, how will I live here? The dog stopped growling and sat down next to Jake. All through breakfast, I thought he was going to attack me. I couldn't eat a single bite. I was still hungry. But at lunchtime, Jake brought a tray of food to my room. How thoughtful he was. He said I'd like it because it was a special sandwich, his mom's recipe. He also added that he had released the shepherd into the yard and now it was time for him to run to work. But he walked all day and didn't come back until late in the afternoon. I was glad that I would be able to rest without this terrible dog. When Jake left, I decided to clean up the house, and in the evening, in the wardrobe, I came across a box marked personal. Well, well, that's interesting. I couldn't resist opening it to see if there were pictures of Jake as a child, but inside was old women's clothing. What kind of nonsense? Why did he keep such things here? Suddenly I started. Someone was scratching at the door. This terrible dog wanted to go home. I shoved the box back in, but I was afraid to let the dog in. What if he bit me? Fortunately, the sound soon subsided. Then I cautiously went to the window to find out where the dog had gone. And suddenly the shepherd dog jumped right at me, barking. Oh dear, Jake did close the window. I barely dodged and fell to the floor. My god, he was going to eat me up. In a panic, I jumped up and ran for the exit. But the mad thing was not far behind. His black fur stood on end and his eyes were bloodshot. He wanted to tear me to pieces. And then I saw Jake standing in the doorway. Thank God, the shepherd immediately obediently stretched out in front of the owner as if he did not want to touch me. But I decided that had enough. I began to say that this wild dog chased me all over the house. I miraculously survived. Jake gave me a gentle hug and began to soothe me. He said that he would definitely come up with something so that I would not worry so much anymore. The next day, Jake took his buddy to a zoo psychologist. He said that he would correct his behavior in a couple of days. Oh, thank God, we could finally be alone together without this monster. In the evening, we watched a romantic movie, but something was bothering me. That's right, that weird box in the closet. 
I wondered why Jake needed those old women's things. All of a sudden, Jake was yelling at me to stay out of the way. I was taken aback. Why was he so turned on? Then Jake seemed to come to his senses. He took my hand and painfully told me that these were his dead mom's things. She passed away recently and it was hard for him to talk about it. I tried to comfort Jake as best as I could, but the evening was ruined. Jake said he wanted to be alone and went to the basement for some reason. I never knew what he was doing there, but he came back late. And when I woke up, Jake was gone. Strange. Where did he go on the weekend? Jake hadn't shown up all day. And I was really scared. What if something had happened to him? I was about to call the police when the phone rang in the house. I didn't dare answer, but after a few rings, the answering machine came on. Jake, this is your mother. Where the hell are you? My stomach turned cold. What? Mother? But Jake said she was dead. I was terrified, but I quickly pulled myself together. I didn't believe in mysticism, so I don't think it was a call from the other world. And then I realized that Jake didn't want to tell me the truth about those women's things. He was hiding something. I decided to sort it out and went to the living room. I opened the same wardrobe, but the box seemed to have disappeared. Then it was like a nightmare. I heard the shepherd barking again. My god, did he run away from the zoo psychologist? And then there was a strange sound under the windows, as if someone was digging the ground. I looked out, and I saw this disgusting dog trying to get into the basement. In a panic, I rushed downstairs. I needed to close the basement window quickly so that the dog did not get in. But the dog was already there. And noticing me, he slowly approached me. Saliva dripped from his fangs. He was about to bite me. But suddenly, the dog took me by the sleeve and began to pull me somewhere. I had no choice but to follow him. My legs stiff with fear. The dog shoved his face into the dusty wardrobe and stood waiting. I carefully opened the doors and saw there... A bound girl! There were bruises and abrasions on her body. God, this is terrible. I couldn't believe it. I quickly untied her and asked her what was wrong. The girl's name was Maggie. After recovering from the shock, she revealed that she had met Jake at a cafe a week ago. He quickly offered to move in with him, and she agreed as she needed an apartment. I shuddered. I had everything exactly the same. But the day after they moved in, Maggie realized that Jake wasn't himself. It was as if he snapped and he kept repeating the phrase, Mom, I didn't do it. Maggie tried to run away from him, but Jake tied her up and locked her in the basement. Maggie's story stunned me. Turned out Jake was a psycho? How could I have missed it? I saw how strangely he reacted to that box. I quickly explained to Maggie that we had to run. Jake might be back any minute. We rushed to the door, but suddenly the road was blocked. It was Jake. We didn't have time. He glanced quickly at Maggie and understood. Well, you'll have company now. He smiled at her madly. Then Jake pulled a rope from behind his back and grabbed us. We tried to fight back, but he still tied us up. After that, Jake said he'd be back soon and punish us. You are very bad. My mother would not approve of that. He whispered ominously. I was shaking with fear. And then I heard a noise at the closet. It was Buddy. He had been hiding under the wardrobe all this time. He crawled out of his hiding place and tried to bite through the ropes. Well done, Buddy. I said, patting him behind the ear. Well, that was not as scary as I thought. Buddy couldn't do it. The ropes were very thick. But after 10 minutes, he finally freed us. Then we heard Jake's footsteps. Panicked, I looked around. The only way to escape was through the window. But it was so high. I somehow got Maggie up and she tried to pull me up, but she didn't have the strength. What to do? I couldn't jump high enough. I tried to find a chair or a box, but there was nothing. And then Buddy ran up to me. He offered his back and I was able to get out. At the same time, Jake burst into the basement. He was furious. We ran away from the house as fast as we could. I was hoping we'd get away in time. But then I saw Jake run out of the entrance and gift chase. Damn it. The police station was only a block away. Maggie and I ran as fast as we could, but Jake was running after us, shouting wildly. He was right next to me, and he was grabbing my arm when suddenly Buddy jumped on him. It turned out that he was also running after us. The dog defended us bravely, but Jake threw him aside. He hit the ground hard and whined, but Buddy distracted Jake and I managed to push the trash cans on him. 
While Jake was recovering, Maggie ran into the station. But he couldn't leave Buddy. He'd saved my life. The dog barely moved, so I had to carry him. At the station, we immediately told the officer about everything and Jake was detained. We later found out that his mother was mentally ill and kept telling Jake that he was responsible for his sister's death. So Jake could not stand it and went crazy. Buddy was taken to the clinic. That crazy Jake broke some of his ribs. I was amazed at the courage of the dog. He was not afraid to attack the owner to save us. Tears welled up in my eyes. Maggie tried to calm me down. She said that he would soon be cured and put in a good shelter. But I couldn't even think about it. What if he's not well there? After the testimony, Maggie stayed at the station to wait for her relatives. I immediately went to see Buddy in the hospital. It was painful to look at him. He could hardly breathe in tears. I begged the doctor to cure Buddy. Dr. Steve promised to do everything possible, but warned that the damage was serious. I think I had nowhere to live again, and it was a good thing Maggie had let me stay with her. I went to the clinic every day to try to take care of Buddy, but he was still unconscious. Doc Steve was very supportive and told me that Buddy was going to get better. But one day, Steve came with bad news. The other doctors gathered the council and decided that Buddy was very ill and needed to be put down. Steve could not convince them. I burst into tears. I was terribly attached to Buddy during this time. In desperation, I burrowed into his thick fur. Please, Buddy, come to your senses. I love you so much. I whispered. And then I felt something hit me gently on the back. It was Buddy. He opened his eyes and was wagging his tail. I hugged him overjoyed. The power of love is capable of many things. I heard Steve's voice behind me. A few days later, Buddy and I arrived at Maggie's house. She didn't mind that we would now live with our savior. Steve often called, asking about Buddy's condition. And one day, he even asked me out on a date. I agreed, but I took Buddy with me because he was a great judge of character. It's still a good idea to get to know someone better before you start dating them. Hello. My name is Chloe. I'm 17 and I love animals. Have you ever lost a pet? Did your parents flush your favorite goldfish down the toilet? Or did you have to put your dog to sleep? If you had to, you know how hard it is. My loss was huge, really huge, because my pets are a whole family of deer. But I can still see them. Watch this video and find out how I lost my pets and how they have become stuffed animals for me to look at. I don't just love animals. I'm ready to work with them my entire life, which until recently has peacefully been taken place in Redwood National Park, where my parents work as caretakers. My childhood was spent in Redwood Park, where I used to play with rabbits among huge redwoods, not with other children on the school playground. While my parents were making their rounds, I pretended to be Mowgli. There was a large natural history museum attached to the park, and I liked to spend my time there too, among the stuffed animals, display cases, and displays. It was great a couple of months ago to try myself as a guide and realize that tourists liked my stories about animals and long walks in the park. By the way, I want to tell you that among all the animals that inhabit Redwood, I was most fond of deer and roe, and I even had a favorite pair, a spotted doe and her baby. I spent so much time with them that they began to respond to my voice and take treats from their hands. Tell me, if your peaceful life was shattered in a single moment, how would you feel? It's just what happened to my life. No, it didn't stop and it didn't look like a nightmare, but something absolutely awful happened. To begin with, for all my love of deer, one of the stuffed animals in our museum scared me to death. A huge deer standing alone in the hall of archaeodactyls. It reminded me of the wax statues in the museum where my parents took me as a child, and from where the ambulance took me in a deep swoon, so I always avoided this room. In short, everything was going well. Favorite pets descended from the pages of Bambi, a favorite part-time job that brought pleasure, what else did a teenager need? It all started quite banal, with the usual rounds that my dad did every morning and every evening. This time, he took me with him, and I still regret it terribly. 
In one of the mesh fences, my father found a long ragged hole from top to bottom. He thought it must have been left by some large animal. Dad was clearly nervous and immediately called the state veterinary control to report the perimeter breach. He kept thinking that some animal, like a bear or something, had torn the net. I didn't like it very much, and my father's nervousness didn't give me any confidence. No, they officially promised my father to search all the surrounding areas to find the culprit. But you must understand that it all looked so strange that we both couldn't find a place on our way back to the keeper's lodge. Dad tried to calm me down, saying that this happened, it had happened before during his work at the park, and there was nothing to worry about. It didn't work out. I still continued to worry, both for the services of usually clueless veterinary control and for the animal that broke through, which was already probably in the nearest city. I was nervous at dinner and I had to hide it. I was terrible at it. So when my parents went to bed, I quietly stole a flashlight from my father's inventory and decided to go to the scene again. Something was bothering me. Do not think that I was afraid to walk through the redwood forest in the dead of night. I was born and raised in this park. I knew every corner of it and every badger pit. I reached the gap, sat down in front of it on the cold ground and studied the broken mesh. I couldn't do the math. I didn't know much about history and I wrote with mistakes, but it took me a minute to realize that the grid had been cut with wire cutters. The break was the work of a two-legged beast, the worst beast I could remember. A man who did his dirty work before dinner, when the keeper was too lazy to investigate because he was in a hurry for a pot of homemade soup and a hearty stew. The fact was that if a large animal suddenly started to break through the mesh, it always left traces of its claws on it. Animals, especially big ones, were bad burglars. And here, each link was carefully cut leaving almost no trace. No, or rather there were tracks, but they led in an indecipherable chain from outside to inside, but not back. There were people somewhere in the huge park at this moment, and it was unlikely that they had come for a tour, since they had to pass the bureaus and ticket offices by illegal means. I should have been scared. A little girl practically abandoned in the forest among giant trees alone with poachers. But I was attacked by a strange anger. I was burning with excitement, going back to our house to get something to protect myself. I didn't risk taking a weapon. It usually didn't end well. I had to settle for a massive flashlight, a walkie-talkie that would instantly link me to the park guard, and my slingshot, which I used to shoot at banks. Imagine that you have a chance to protect what you love. Would you jump into battle like I did? Like a true Indian, I followed the trail of the criminals at the gap and quickly plunged into the forest. The poacher was found near a deer feeder. Boldly and foolishly, I offered to surrender, pointing the flashlight at him. I didn't have enough hands for a slingshot. No, I just promised to contact security and the police immediately, showing him my walkie-talkie as proof. Such a great adventure sent a rush of adrenaline through my blood. The poacher must have sensed it, because he turned slowly and tried to calm me down. He said it was all for the money, and he didn't want anything bad. All he wanted was a deer skin, and so on, and I hardly listened to him. Just as I was about to call security in triumph, someone chuckled loudly over my head. I was so happy to catch one poacher that I forgot to guard the rear. The second one came out of the woods right behind me. I screamed in surprise and fear. Oh, how I still regret it. At my voice, my pet came out of the darkness, squinting in the light of the flashlights, followed by her baby hesitantly moving its thin legs. I shouted for them to get away. I was scared and I took off. I had to cross the clearing and disappear into the darkness. But my body's memory <laughs> failed me. My foot fell into a badger pit, gave away with a crunch, and my head landed neatly on a flat rock. When I came through from the pain in my temples and the back of my head, it was all over. The poachers were caught by the police, called by veterinary control, right at the exit of the park, 
and my parents sent me to the hospital in an ambulance. I hit my head too hard. Redwood's dear herd was almost halved, and my pets were the first to be killed by the damned poachers. I cried so much that I was detained in the hospital for an extra day. My parents knew what these animals meant to me. Perhaps that's why Dad convinced the head of the park museum to add a couple more stuffed animals to the collection. And he brought a specialist to Redwood, who made beautiful stuffed animals out of poor deer that looked almost like they were alive. My appearance in court was enough to put two criminals away for a long time. But I completely lost my faith in humans. From now on, I made a promise to trust only animals. The taxidermist allowed me to work with him for a while. It was exciting, though sad, but I was glad to have even such a pitiful opportunity to keep my favorite pets with me and in the memory of other people. I almost stopped being afraid of stuffed animals when my lovely Doe and Fawn were put in the same hall of artiodactyls, with an old stag that no longer looked lonely and scary. Now it had its own reindeer family, and I liked to sit on the floor in front of them, studying, reading, or just watching them. Now I am taming the deer again, but I no longer train them to use my voice, so as to not let them down again by accident some dark night. I take excursions to my favorites in the museum, telling tourists what wonderful deer they are. The story of the poachers in Redwood became scandalous. Everyone especially liked the frightened, whimpering girl who appeared in court. I mean, me. Alas, any scandals always go to the park for the benefit. A terrible trait of human nature, you must admit. I prefer to spend all my free time with my pets in the quiet of the museum hall. It's better with them than with people. Did you like my story? I think that you will get at least some of my love for animals and it will make the world a little better. I want to believe it. Subscribe to our channel. New stories regularly appear here. They are no worse than mine. Like the video if you found it interesting and appreciate your pets while they are around. Hi, I'm Tammy and I'm 13 years old. Have you ever felt like you swallowed something alive? As if you have something inside you threatening your life? This story happened to me, and the feeling of it still haunts me. Watch this video to the end and find out what will happen to a person if they swallow a poisonous snake. My parents devoted their entire life to biology, so I was interested in exotic animals and insects since childhood. What ordinary children were afraid of were my favorite toys. And instead of bedtime stories, I like to listen to encyclopedias and scientific work of my mom and dad. I always wanted to have an exotic animal at home, but my parents were against it, saying that it could be dangerous and that they had enough of them at work. Until recently, my father was given a small and rare poisonous snake for his birthday. I was thrilled! Of course, I immediately wanted to play with it, but my dad stopped me. He placed the snake in the home terrarium and said that it should not be touched during the adaptation. And he forbade me to take it without permission because it was poisonous. I was upset, but still, I couldn't stand it and my curiosity took over. Have you ever disobeyed your parents? The next day after my parents left for work, I snuck into my dad's office and played with the snake. I decided to name him Tony. So in secret, I continued to visit Tony every day. But over time, I got bored playing with it alone, and I wanted to show off the snake to my best friend Carl. I decided to prank him, and I really thought it would be fun, but my plan failed. We sat and played our favorite game. I told Carl I was going to get us something to eat, let Tony out of the terrarium, and carried it to my room without being seen. I thought Carl would get scared, we would laugh together and play with the snake. But the prank got out of control. When Carl saw the snake on his leg, he jumped up in horror, screamed loudly. His face turned completely white. He fell to the floor and he began to suffocate. Honestly, I didn't even know what to do, but it was necessary to act quickly. I found a brown bag in the kitchen, ran to Carl, and he started breathing into it slowly coming to himself. I gave him a glass of water, he drank it, 
and started yelling at me. It turned out that he couldn't stand snakes, lizards, and all the alike. As a child, he was even allergic to them. He accused me of knowing about it and setting it up on purpose. But I had no idea that Carl had such a fear. We had a big fight. Carl took offense at me and slammed the door. I returned the snake to the terrarium before my parents noticed and went to my room. I was very sad that we had a fight because this has never happened in all of our friendship. So I had nightmares the next night. I was almost asleep and in my sleep, I thought that something cold was lying on my stomach and beginning to crawl to my head. It crawled right into my mouth and I couldn't even move. I woke up the next morning in a cold sweat. I was afraid, and what I saw and felt in the dream seemed very real. I was very scared and quickly ran to look at the terrarium, but it was empty. My legs began to shake, and I clutched my stomach and couldn't move. Was there a little snake inside me now? Just thinking about it made me feel sick, and I ran to the bathroom. Apparently, I didn't close the lid properly yesterday and Tony just crawled out of the terrarium and into my mouth. Even in the morning, I felt something moving on my lips. It was just awful. I couldn't sleep, walk, or even eat. And it always seemed to me that there was a chill in my esophagus. Something alive. It was as if something cold-blooded had crawled all over it. More and more thoughts came into my head, and I couldn't handle them alone. So the next day at school, I found Carl, asked him for forgiveness, and told him what had happened to me. He was so shocked, as if he had quarreled with me. He started thinking about how to solve this problem. He was worried about me. It was nice, but it looked like he knew about it. I decided not to attach importance to his reaction. Carl told me to go to the doctor right away, started saying that it was very serious and we couldn't solve it ourselves. I burst into tears and said that I would never go to the doctor. I needed a friend's help. Are you afraid of doctors and hospitals? And then we remember that Carl's mother was a biologist and she had a very rare book on cold-blooded animals at home. Carl calmed me down, and we ran to his house right after school. We had to do everything before his mother arrived. We snuck into her office and started looking for the right book, and I was getting worse and worse and very sick to my stomach. Carl was worried because his mom's office was a restricted area in the house, and he was always rushing me but I couldn't move any faster. I was constantly dizzy from fear. Unexpectedly for us, the handle of the front door turned. Carl's mom came home early and she found us in her office. She started yelling at us and especially at Carl and even threatened house arrest, but I couldn't let that happen. So I gathered my thoughts and told her everything. She hesitated and seemed less angry and I thought she calmed down a little too quickly. Maybe she was just worried about me. She said that most likely I need to be examined by a doctor because the snake could damage my esophagus or even poison me. And since the snake was poisonous, it could dissolve in the stomach and the poison would get directly into my blood. It only made me feel worse. I knew it was a lost cause. Everything went too far. I would have to tell my parents. Carl's mother quickly arranged an appointment, and half an hour later, we were on our way to the hospital. I felt worse every minute. I blamed myself for everything. I lost a friend, hid everything from my father, and violated his ban. She said that she would have to tell my parents, but I decided that I would tell them myself. Meanwhile, my stomach was turning. I really thought that the snake poison was already in my blood. I was constantly sick in the car and I barely made it to the hospital. I was already sitting in line, looking pale and scared, 
when Carl's mother said that I would probably get a gastroscopy, and if necessary, they would perform emergency surgery. I sat in the corridor and was trembling with fear. I was supposed to be called in for a checkup any minute. And then I saw my parents. They looked very serious and even angry, so I couldn't stand it. I jumped out of my chair and excused myself to my mom and dad. The fear of the examination, the operation, and the whole situation overwhelmed me even more. I immediately told my parents everything. And when I finished and opened my eyes, I saw my dad smiling gently at me. At first, I didn't understand why, and he showed me a jar with a snake. I was shocked. Did I just dream it up and almost drive myself crazy? How could this happen? Suddenly, Dad took the snake out of the jar and held it out to me, and I immediately jumped back, afraid that it might bite me and inject poison. But my father showed me that the snake had no teeth. I didn't understand what was going on, and my parents admitted that I was just being pranked, almost as much as I had pranked Carl. My parents said they wanted me to learn this lesson and never disobey them again for my own safety. Yes, it's hard not to learn. It turned out that Carl had told them all about my joke. I asked where had the snake from the terrarium gone. It turned out that my dad just took it to his lab. I was so glad I hadn't swallowed the snake that I forgot my parents and Carl had taught me a valuable lesson. I was surprised that I didn't notice anything, but apparently my imagination did everything for me and I couldn't think of anything but the snake. I knew it was all for my own good. I could have hurt Carl with my joke and my stupidity and curiosity could play a trick on me. Now I avoid my father's office. I try not to stick my nose and hands into everything. And for this behavior, my parents promised to give me my own terrarium with a water snake. If you liked the video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to the channel. Be careful with your imagination and have a good day.